Hello and welcome to Spotlight here on MSF TV. I'm Monica Attard. Well, the theme of the week here at MSF TV is epidemics and neglected diseases. This area makes up a large proportion of the organisation's field activities. Médecins Sans Frontières Australia board member and returned field worker Dr Stuart Condon joins me here in the studio. Dr Condon, welcome. Thanks for having me. Can we begin by me asking you a pretty big question? What would it take, do you think, to eradicate the more prevalent of diseases which have the capacity to become epidemics? There needs to be a will. That, that's what it comes down to. There needs to be a will on behalf of the citizens of the world to do that. A will that we saw with polio earlier in the last century. And certainly it, it's a will we're starting to see with HIV and TB, but we haven't seen completely yet. Well, let's look at some of the individual diseases. And I'd like to begin with HIV because it's been around for an awfully long time, hasn't it? 30 years. That's right. Do you, would you say that it's still an epidemic proportion? It is. Look, by all accounts, we're not dealing with it. We're not dealing with it in the best way. We've still got around 7 million people estimated who should be on HIV treatment and are not. We're talking about people who are living in countries who unfortunately don't have access to good medical care. And they don't have access to what the WHO tells us is free care for HIV patients. Well, we'll look at some of those problems in a moment, but where is it most problematic? Look, Asia and Africa are the two centres we worry about the most. Africa has always been a problem for HIV uh, patients. Treatment centres have only been developed in the last 10 to 20 years, actually getting treatment out to patients. The problem we're seeing more recently is in Asia, so countries such as Myanmar, where there's no access to medical care at all and antiretrovirals are really not a priority. Mm. And does the pattern of its spread change quite frequently? Up and down. Look, at country to country basis, yes. The problem is we're seeing it slowly progress and we're not dealing with that progression. And it's a worldwide phenomenon. And what's causing the progression then? It's, it's a lackadaisical attitude to the, the epidemic. It's, it's an epidemic slow in progress. It's not like an Ebola where you can say there is an outbreak mm. from one week to the next. Mm. It's happening over years and decades. And is the fact that there are now such effective drug treatments to, to deal with it, is that causing a degree of complacency, do you think? In a way, yes, mm. because they've developed the antiretrovirals. There is, should be access to the, the treatment, but in many countries they're not. So there is a complacency, yep. But has there been progress? I mean, are you managing to contain it where it does occur? Look, Médecins Sans Frontières is, is working in different countries trying to do the best we can. But we can't manage to treat all of the HIV patients in the world. We're doing as much as we can. We're showing that the model of cheap medical care for these patients is quite possible to implement. We're showing that access should be easy to implement. We're trying to encourage other actors to get involved as well, but we can't do everything ourselves. Mm. Now, there are effective treatments, as we've mentioned, for HIV, and they've come down in price as well, which has been a boon, certainly, in the West. But the price and access is still quite prohibitive, is it not, in Africa? That's right. And we're, we're looking at drugs which initially were very expensive to, to actually research, develop, and put out into the field. To mm -hmm. get to a patient, it took hundreds and thousands of dollars to actually develop a drug. That has come down, you're right. And there's, there's great successes of what's happened in getting the drugs out to patients now. But in Africa, there are still problems getting the drugs to the patients, it's true. In, in parts of Asia as well, it's not just a cost issue. It's, it's much more a, an issue of awareness and the drive to get those medications to those patients. So. Uh is the question then also one of convincing people to be diagnosed? In a way, that's part of it. That's part of the bigger problem about uh, diagnostics and treatment. So it's not just about having the drugs, but an understanding of risk and, and testing possibilities. Being able to go and see their local doctor and have a rapid test is much more uh, easy, much easier to facilitate in a way than having to travel to a capital city to do the same with an intensive blood test the way it used to be. So it's education? That's right. Mm. And it's taking education to small communities? <coughs> That's right. And is that something that is, in, is within uh, MSF's remit? I mean, can you do that? We try. Certainly it's part of any good HIV program to talk about education and counselling, talk about uh, contact tracing for partners and family members, talk about maternal and child health in the same prism of HIV and AIDS patients. Mm. We want to try to think about every aspect of the illness. And it is a community aspect that we've got to consider as well. It's not just about giving drugs to a patient in a particular situation. It impacts in so many different ways. Mm. So what needs to be done then to make uh, drugs affordable and accessible in Africa and in Asia? Mm. 
It's, it does come down to a will and ultimately... A political will. A political will, absolutely. It's, it's not the problem that we, we don't have the drugs anymore. It's not the problem that we don't understand the illness. We, we're starting to get research developing a, a further understanding of the scientific side of the illness and, and the virus itself. What we need now is actually the will to make sure that everyone is getting the treatment. We do have an equity to treatment and we do have an understanding that everyone has the same access rights. Mm. And where is that will most problematic in your view? We're talking about government level and we're talking about international institutions. We're talking about individual governments and, and I'm not going to name countries but certainly there are some which are not as willing to implement uh, HIV policies as they should be. But also international organisations. We're, we're thinking about people who work in the WHO and those larger organisations who unfortunately are part of large bureaucratic organisations and can't implement things as quickly as they may want to. Mm. We would like to see that those organisations, UN agencies, WHO and, and national governments actually think about this as planning for the future. But why, why Dr Condon, do you think that there is a reluctance uh, at a government level, at a national level, to deal with the HIV problem? It's hard to say. There, there should be a will. And certainly from a medical ethical point of view, everyone's got the same right to the But is the it sticking your, ha your head in the sand and saying, no, this is not a problem for us? Oh, no. I, I, I don't know if they're hiding it. And, and I don't think they're hiding from it. I, I think they certainly know about it and certainly the advocacy efforts that Nitsan Sans Frontier is trying to, to push these governments and to, to get them to look at the problem. Part of it is funding as well. Mm -hmm. We're talking about global rounds of funding which should be getting the money to the governments and unfortunately in recent years have dropped off and they're not getting the, the funding rounds as they should be. Well, it is extraordinary, I think, and would be extraordinary to most people to know that there is such a disparity between the price and the availability of drugs for the treatment of HIV in the developed world and the non-developed world. Mm. How long? Why? Uh, look, the, it, it's not just the HIV drugs. There's a lot of disparities between the Western world and the third world, and, and this is just one of them. Talk about access to tuberculosis drugs as well. If I was seeing a patient in central Sydney or uh, in, in any capital city in a, a Western country, I would have excellent diagnostic facilities and specialists at the ready to have a look at my TB patient. In a third world country, I don't have the same. I worked in Sudan where we had a TB project which was admitting patients on a regular basis over the course of years. Mm. We were, were seeing patients who had no access to any health care, let alone tuberculosis health care. TB is meant to be one of the priorities in world health at the moment, but at the time we were seeing these patients, they didn't know anything about their illness. Okay, well let's talk about TB because a lot of people know about TB. It has been around an awfully long time. Personally, I find it surprising that it's still such a problem. So why, do I. Why is it? Uh, look, it's, it's again, it's about will. And, and it's that sense that it's one of these neglected diseases. It's one of the ones that doesn't make the headlines. It doesn't come onto the, the front sheet of a, a newspaper in the morning and, and tell you, oh, another 10,000 people have died of TB this month, this year. Mm. We don't see it in the same way. It's slow as well. It's not an exciting illness. If, if you're a doctor and taking care of TB patients, you don't have the same kudos as an emergency physician seeing trauma patients. Is that right? It's, it's a sense that it's a slow-growing bacteria as well. Yes. It takes a minimum six months to treat, mm -hmm. and that's for the non-drug-resistant version. If you're talking about the drug-resistant version, which we're seeing more and more, we're talking about two years and tens of thousands of dollars of diagnostics and uh, management around that one patient, mm. per patient. What sort of numbers are we talking about with TB globally? Millions and millions. Look, we're, we're talking about uh, a slow-growing process in many different countries. Mm -hmm. It is an AIDS-defining AIDS illness as well, and that, that's something we should remember. HIV and TB go together because it's a sense of immunity in the body system. And I, I don't want to go too much into the me medicine of it, but certainly it's one of these illnesses we see in poverty, in malnourished uh, patients as well. And in countries where there is a situation where conflict or natural disasters come up and people are undernourished, mm. they don't get the treatment they should from a body system point of view and tuberculosis can take over. So HIV is a push factor as far as TB is concerned? We think so. Mm. Another one uh, that I've read about is the collapse of the Soviet Union mm. and, and uh, the the problems in the uh, early 1990s where, uh, well, a problem from a public health perspective, but clearly not a political perspective locally. What 
happened there? Why was the fall of communism and the opening up of the former USSR such a problem for TB? At the time, there, there wasn't a sense that tuberculosis was an emergency. Uh, and certainly, uh, the political and economic consequences of the USSR opening up were fantastic, for, uh, arguably fantastic. Cross-border movements increased, though, and, and people were moving across and having exposure to, to illnesses all around the world. Mm. We saw systems of, of medical care change very rapidly as well. And the mistrust that, unfortunately, some of the patients were having of the medical system meant that they were, unfortunately, very unwell for long periods of time and not getting the treatment they should have. Mm. A lot of these patients had TB. A lot of them were living in ru very rural conditions, undernourished, and TB was part of their, their illness. People were dying in that same situation of tuberculosis. Mm. The care that they needed wasn't there. And, and certainly the movements around the borders didn't help that at all. Mm. And when the borders opened up, of course, that created a huge political issue for governments to deal with because as much as uh, they weren't getting the care that they needed there, they also wanted to leave and join you know, new communities and, mm. and families. So that did create and has created, has it not, an ongoing political problem? It has, absolutely. And it's something we're still struggling with today. A lot of the eastern states, uh, western states of the USSR were very problematic at the time and they still are. I think of Georgia, which is a long-running TB project for Médecins Sans Frontières. We're still struggling with tuberculosis cases there. And many of those now are drug-resistant cases, which are becoming harder and harder to treat. And so what sort of figures are we talking about in, in, in very small countries like Georgia? The prevalence is, is higher than normal. I, I don't have an exact figure. Mm. Certainly we're talking about hundreds of thousands of patients who, who are on the treatment. The drug resistant version is the one we're worried about the most. Mm. It's, it's not a sense of the, a pure number in that, in that uh, drug resistant tuberculosis, but it is a sense that they are increasing as a proportion of general tuberculosis. Well, let's talk a bit about drug resistant TB because mm. that is, as you say, quite prevalent. How is the research moving in that direction? Are we any closer to being able to, to do something about it? We are. Look, there, there are positive moves. We've now got machines and, and diagnostic methods which help us quite quickly compared to the old methods of just straight culture and microscopy, helping us diagnose tuberculosis patients. They're happening a lot quicker than they used to. What needs to improve a little bit more now is the diagnostics for children. And, and it's always the way that we often find children are the last to be involved in the medical care uh, innovation. We're, we're looking at basic algorithms as to whether you can tell if a child has tuberculosis or not, drug resistant tuberculosis or not, because they don't cough up things in the same way that an adult might. Mm. I'm sorry, it's a little bit uh, grotesque in that's a way, okay, but that's, that's how we diagnose it. And yeah, it is, yeah. it's very primitive, the, the way that we look at this disease still. So what, what percentage then of TB sufferers around the world are children? Can you tell us that? Is there, is there, is there a figure on that? There, there probably is. I don't know that figure, Monica, no. Mm. Okay. Uh, because it's hard, it, as you say, it is harder to diagnose in them, harder to treat <coughs> as well, I assume? It is, yeah. And, and certainly the, the problem we find is as much as it is it is the minority of cases. They've got the exposure in the family as much as any other family member. Because they've got that exposure, it might be tuberculosis in the lung, but there's lots of other TBs that you can have. You can have mm -hmm. TB in the spine. You can have right. TB in your lymph nodes. Right. There's lots of different ways it can happen. Right. And, and the diagnostic methods need to catch up on that. Mm. And is there a problem with the diagnostic methods in remote areas or in areas that are otherwise you know, difficult to operate in? And what there are they? Are. What are those problems? It's about electricity for, for the machines that do the diagnostics. It's about access to the doctors and the nurses who are taking care of the TB patients. In some of the projects we run in Médecins Sans Frontières projects, we're talking about large hospitals which are taking care of tuberculosis patients, but people in the rural areas will actually need to travel a long distance to get there. Mm -hmm. We're trying to look at different models now, trying to get into community models where we can actually go to the patient if we can. It does involve a lot of logistical management. It does involve a lot of travel. Mm -hmm. We're trying to see if we can tip the model the other way. Mm -hmm. And another one of the problems I think that, that you face is that the treatment can often be quite long, two years. Do mm. people lose interest in continuing the medication and the mm. treatment? What happens there? They do. And, and for the drug resistant one, you're talking about going up to two years. There's no actual guarantee that that will be a cure. And so there will still be, need to be tests at the end of that treatment course to make sure that they've actually been cured of their TB. Uh, again, I'll, I'll go back to my experience in Sudan. It was my first mission with Médecins Sans Frontières. I was seeing tuberculosis patients 
for real for the first time. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was very confronting to see essentially a third world textbook disease in children, in adults, in, in so many different kinds of patients. We struggled with diagnostics. We had basic labro lab facilities mm -hmm. and we had access to the medicines. That, that was the thankful point. But we were noticing that people, exactly as you're saying, didn't complete their treatment. We needed to offer incentives for them in a way to actually complete their treatment. So we offered food incentives and for the people who were living remotely, we offered accommodation for a limited number of the patients so that they could stay at least for the first two months, yep. stay close to the treatment facility, get the food, get the medications. We could monitor their progress as well. After that intensive phase, we would then be able to discharge them back to their village, give them a supply of medication, see them regularly after that. Do you think that there was simply not a comprehension or an understanding of how serious the disease was? That's right. That's right. And it's something that's accepted as normal too. Yeah. And what can an organisation like MSF do about educating people, about telling people that this is actually a life-threatening and very, very serious disease which can threaten their entire community? That's, that's the responsibility as a, a good medical organisation to, to educate, to counsel, to essentially inform the population at risk. These are the risks. This is what we can do. This is what we can't do. Mm. And, and actually give them a sense of informed consent on a, on a community level. We would try to tell people, look, this is a life-threatening disease. You might not be sick today, but if you finish only one month of this treatment, you will come back to us possibly with a harder version of the illness to treat. Mm, like like a, a, a bad virus. Exactly right. If you don't take the medicine, it will come back. Exactly. Well, w even worse for tuberculosis, a resistant version of, uh, of the illness. So if we're talking about a partial complete, uh, partially completed treatment, we'd want to make sure that they did complete it. At least we knew if they hadn't been cured, we could treat again. But if we lose them halfway through, we just didn't know. And mm. then they might come back to us in months or years with a, a worse version, exactly right. Well, having seen it, uh, as you have in Sudan, are you hopeful that it can ever be eradicated? I think it can. I'm optimistic on tuberculosis. Okay. I, I think it's, it's not a dramatic disease and if people understand from the beginning that there is a different model they have to follow, it is quite possible. It's about doing something now and, and unfortunately we've been talking about doing something now for years. It's, it's an illness which is a third world illness in nature and it's not expensive to treat the non-resistant form. We're, we're talking about older drugs with a lot of side effects, but it is still possible to treat. But again, it comes back to that will. It comes back to political will. That's right. And international funding. Yep. And is the, is the problem for TB that it, it simply dropped down in the list of priorities for international bodies? Mm. Because we've had SARS and bird flu and all of these other dramatic illnesses which affect different people in the world. Right. And of course attract a lot more publicity. Correct. Mm. Whereas TB is something that we all expect is prevalent in the third <coughs> world and that we need to deal with it. And unfortunately I think it's a little bit out of mind, out of sight. Unfortunately we don't see the person dying or suffering from tuberculosis in the third world. We do see the business traveller who's got a cough and gets screened at the airport because they've got a fever. Mm. It's, it's about visibility. If we have that visibility for tuberculosis, like any of these other illnesses we're talking about, I think there is a way that we can start treating and managing and possibly curing the, the world of the disease. Well, Dr Condon, one disease that has a lot of visibility is meningitis. Mm. But it can be fatal. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about meningitis. Tell us in which segments of the population is it most dangerous? Look, worldwide we worry about the meningitis belt in Africa. Uh, this is this central area typically getting epidemics from uh, particular periods, you know, December to June typically. It's, it's a dry season effect. It's meningitis just like you might hear about in the Daily Telegraph if you're in Sydney or any other uh, newspaper around the country because this is a horrible illness that uh, can give horrible consequences. Mm -hmm typically affecting children the worst, but can affect adults, and entirely preventable. It's the same strain, in fact, as one of the ones we worry about uh, where we are. And it comes across as epidemic, so it's transmitted through populations very quickly. You'll find that someone might have a little bit of nausea, some fever, some non-specific signs, then they might have some stiff neck, rashes sometimes are found. And then very quickly through a population it will spread. But given that you can predict almost, because it's seasonal, that you can predict its occurrence, does that mean that you're in a position where you literally have to track and chase it? 
We prepare for it, and, and we, we know from season to season uh, if there have been cases. Certainly, Médecins Sans Frontières works in many of the countries in the meningitis belt already. We know where to expect it. We know which populations are going to be possibly affected. In a way, we prepare ourselves with projects, and we're always having it in the back of our mind, look, is this meningitis? Having our field projects report into the headquarters and, and to the capital missions, mm -hmm. it's really important for us to communicate on a, a weekly basis and sometimes a daily basis at the start of an outbreak. Mm -hmm. If we have it in mind and we start seeing cases and we start getting diagnostics coming back as positive and treating meningitis patients, we've got quite a low threshold to start a population-wide uh, vaccination campaign and treatment campaign for the, the treated patients too. Because of course if you don't get on top of it at that point, you then have to scale up quite dramatically I imagine. That's right and that's a great example of that from 2009. In Chad, Niger and Nigeria, Médecins Sans Frontières treated 7 million patients, vaccinated 7, 7 million, million patients. That's a huge number. Because the risk is so high. Yeah. Across three countries in the belt, we were worried that it could go unchecked and it, essentially it's a killer disease, not again in the Ebola uh, form, but it's one of these ones that can leave children with horrible disabilities and kill many, many people. But in a sense that's outsmarting meningitis, isn't it? Mm. And that's what you need to do. That's right. But that has its challenges, I imagine, logistically on the ground. What is the biggest one, do you think? Cold chain's important and cold chain's this idea of, of keeping your vaccine cold. It's difficult How in a place like... How do you do like, that in the Sahara? Well, well look, <laughs> it's, it's where the logisticians come into their own. We, we've got a team of specialists who are experts in, in making things happen. And everyone talks about the doctors and nurses of Médecins Sans Frontières, the, the clinicians who are seeing the patients. But for me, it's the logisticians who make the organisation run. They're the ones who are able to get the shipments in, make sure the airstrip is in a good, uh, in a good form so the plane can land. And then having all of the vaccine brought in very quickly, as you're talking about the scaling up, uh, is important to make, make sure it's all cold and in good conditions, make sure it's not past expiry, make sure we're getting the good vaccines, we've got enough needles and syringes, we've got enough workers to actually deliver the vaccine to all of these people. The, the experience of the 2009 epidemic was incredible. We've got to keep things cold, we use a lot of ice bricks, <laughs> quite honestly a lot of ice bricks. Wow. And a lot of... Uh, because you'd be often in areas where there's no electricity. So that's right. You, you, how do you generate electricity? There'll be typically a capital, uh, a log base or a logistic base where we've got a lot of fridges and, and we will essentially keep everything cold there and they will travel out to the field with limited supplies day by day. But I imagine as well that the distances that you need to travel from base to wherever you need to go would be quite huge. Mm. I mean, there'd be huge swathes of territory <coughs> that you need to cover, no? There's a lot of planning and, and we use a lot of generators as well. I don't mention the generators very often because they're, they're typically noisy and the generators that I remember kept me up at night. But I, I remember the generators were used in a limited way, as well as all of the ice bricks, as well as all of the fridges. We've just got to keep it all cold chain and, and keep that secure so that the vaccine gets into the patient and that we're talking about good, effective, preventative treatment for a population. And how many people do you think, uh, of, um, well, roughly speaking, how many people would be involved in an exercise like that, where you're vaccinating, where you're trying to beat the disease by mm. vaccinating ahead of its um, onslaught? Hundreds and hundreds. Look, uh, we employ short-term staff in that kind of situation. We talk about uh, a limited number of expatriate staff who fly in for the epidemic and, and make sure that with experience that it, it does go well. But we're also talking about a lot of local staff who are trained up, a lot of local nurses and doctors. And we shouldn't forget the treatment of the patients as well. Inevitably, some of these patients will get meningitis. They do need treatment. They do need to stay in hospital. So we're talking about hundreds and sometimes thousands of people. In the epidemic, we were talking about thousands of staff that were delivering the vaccines and treating the patients. It was quite incredible. That is incredible. Now, in relation to 2009, by what percentage was the death rate lowered as a result of that campaign? I can't give you an exact figure. I know that we, we stopped a lot of people dying. We're talking only about between one and 2,000 people who had the illness in the end, and we're talking about 7 million who received the vaccine. Mm -hmm. it, it can't be measured how important it is to actually vaccinate in that kind of situation. Let me give you another example. I was in the Pakistan area just after the earthquake near Kashmir. We had a lot of people displaced by the earthquake. A lot of them were returning to their homes, heading up to the mountain areas. We were looking at a situation where many of them were, again, unvaccinated for measles this mm -hmm. time. And we worry about measles in particular settings. 
refugee camps, people uh, who were displaced and returning. Mm -hmm. We thought it was a priority enough, even though we're talking about 15,000 people in the end, to actually vaccinate enough of the children, particularly for measles, so that we wouldn't have an um, outbreak of measles. Right. Now, can I just briefly talk to you about cholera, because this is something that you have treated. You have worked mm. in Bangladesh That's right. with cholera patients. Now, it is also subject to seasonal and sporadic outbreak. Mm. I assume as a result, you can usually predict where it's going to happen. What do you do to prepare for that? Again, it's logistics. Cholera is, is actually not very medical in the end. Uh, the, the illness itself causes dehydration. We're talking about a, a whole body response to the bacterium and again it, it's quite awful, unchecked, many, many patients die. Mm -hmm. There's actually a specialised cholera hospital in, in Dhaka in Bangladesh which is specialised in this seeing more than 100,000 cases every year and their mortality rates are almost zero. If patients get to them quickly enough, they can treat, rehydrate and save the patient's life. Because hydration is more important than vaccination, isn't That's it? That's right. We, we, current vaccination. The vaccines at the moment have limited use, but exactly right. The, the hydration element can't be underestimated. And water supplies. When we're talking about a cholera outbreak, we want to make sure that we've got clean water. So we're talking about using chlorine to chlorinate local water sources as necessary. Getting uh, buckets and beds and cholera treatment centres is, is what we always plan for, but we hope that we don't need to. And then also oral rehydration solutions. So this is something that's with, developed decades ago and we're still using. It, it's the solution that you can mix with clean water, give to patients who have got a mild version of the illness, don't have to have them hospitalised. They can go home and just make sure they keep their fluids up and actually survive the illness. And again, do you think that there is the will to overcome cholera? Cholera is hard. It, it, again, it doesn't feature in the media, you don't see it in the news, it's, it's one of these ones that it's a little bit grotesque to talk about but it's, it's again one of these ones you don't see it unless there's an epidemic. Mm. I don't know if there's a will for cholera uh, and certainly a lot of the work for cholera is more oriented towards the water and sanitation element mm -hmm. than anything on the vaccine. Mm -hmm. it, it's a different modality. We're, we're talking about making sure that people get good water and then it should follow that cholera becomes less of a problem. Dr Connor, we're going to wind it up very soon, but I want to ask you before we do that, because uh, you've been in this business a very, very long time now, and you've, uh, you've worked in Sudan, in Aceh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. Now that must have been at times, if not all the time, very, very, very challenging and emotionally taxing. Mm. Was it? It was. It was. And, and going from my first mission, which is this almost dreamy experience of going to Africa and working in Sudan and doing the work I'd, I'd dreamt about for so long to these other different experiences and, and still trying to treat patients in the best way you could with limited resources. That was probably the hardest part. Mm. We see that in parts of Australia still, but there are many countries around the world where this is almost accepted as normal. Mm. Um, you do as much as you can. You, you try to do as much as you can. You, you struggle with authorities who don't let you into particular hospitals or to particular areas of the community because it's about control and they, they can't actually allow you to see a, a rebel side or, or go to another area where there might be sick patients. The struggle, I think, is, is trying to work as best as you can as a doctor and, and treat the people that you want to treat. What made you want to do this, this kind of work? Uh, I think I'd always thought there's more to life as a doctor than seeing patients in hospital in Australia for me. Um, I knew that I was quite privileged to, to receive the education I had. Uh, I was lucky to be born in a country where I could become a doctor through an almost free university system without having to, to struggle too much mm. and, and I was very fortunate. I, I wanted to be able to do something different and I wanted to actually reflect on working as a doctor in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. I think the challenges of working as a doctor in different parts of the world, I, I didn't realise at the time. I understand now that you can't do everything, unfortunately, but you have to try. Mm -hmm. You have to try. I wanted to try. Again, though, that to me says that you are the sort of person who had to have been exposed to the levels of despair out there and the, and the, the great urgency and need to make a difference. Were you exposed to those kind of things? Mm. How? Uh, look, there, there were patients we couldn't treat. There, there were patients I remember who, who died or we, we lost to follow up where we didn't know what happened with them. 
We had patients who were angry at us because they didn't receive the treatment that they wanted, but we were trying to do the best thing for them in, in those situations. And, and we had, unfortunately, some constructive feedback on, on some of our missions and projects where we maybe weren't working in the best interest of a community, but we were treating the patients in the way that they should have been treated. Mm -hmm. There, there's always this, this feeling at the end of a mission that you could have done more, you could have done something differently. It's, it's hard, it's definitely hard, mm -hmm. but it's very interesting work. Dr Condon, I thank you very, very much for your time today. Welcome, thank you. And thank you for watching. Join us next week when Richard Moorcroft will be speaking with Médecins Sans Frontières Executive Director Paul McFun discussing next week's theme, which is natural disasters. Now, if you'd like to join the discussion, use the hashtag, hashtag MSFTV, or leave your comments on Facebook. I'm Monica Attard. Goodbye for now.